Hello, my name is Michael O'Connor and I'm an Associate Professor in Christianity and Culture and Book and Media Studies at the University of St Michael's College. Those of you with high school aged children will doubtless be thinking about their educational and professional future. What should they study in university? Humanities, sciences, social science, technology? How can they maximise their chances of success while still developing into intelligent, healthy and well-rounded citizens and leaders? We'll be reflecting on those questions in today's lecture. Our speaker is my friend and colleague, Professor Jean-Olivier Richard, who is an Assistant Professor of Christianity and Science at the University of St. Michael's College. He received his BA from Concordia University in 2009 and completed his PhD in the History of Science and Technology at Johns Hopkins University in 2016. The following year he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia and he joined us here at St Mike's the following year in 2017. Professor Richard's academic interests include the relationship of science with Christianity in the early modern, modern era, Jesuit history, environmental history, and the history of alchemy, astrology, and magic. What ties all of these subjects together is his fascination with the polymathic endeavours and universal systems of ecclesiastical thinkers, as well as the ways in which the past, whether real or imagined, inspired early modern discoveries. Professor Richard co-teaches a first-year seminar called Intelligence, Artificial and Human. This course brings together students aspiring to become computer scientists with humanists and social scientists in the making. In today's lecture, he will share more about that seminar, about the importance, value and challenge of an interdisciplinary approach to teaching in the humanities and technology. Thank you for joining and do enjoy the lecture. I presume I've already been introduced, uh, in case I haven't. My name is Jean-Olivier Richard. I teach in the Christianity and Culture Program at St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto. Um, let me first thank the organizers of this series. Uh, it's really a privilege and an honor to be able to speak uh, in front of so many of you, albeit uh, in a pre-recorded format. Uh, I very much look forward to the Q&A so we can engage face-to-face uh, the talk uh, today is entitled Future of Work and Education, a case for an integrated STEAM and humanities curriculum. Um, this is somewhat of a grander uh, topic perhaps than what I will have time to cover this time around. Uh, let me begin by um, again stating what I presume is the case here. Some of you I would imagine are parents or guardians. Um, it's likely that you have encountered statistics uh, like the followings um, as part of your casual readings and that those statistics have created some anxieties. Um, you might be wondering what path your children, if you have any, uh, should take in order to maximize the chances of success in the competitive marketplace that is bound to transform uh, as, for instance, AI and other cutting edge technology will take ever greater space in them. The question I ask myself as an educator um, is what can I do to ensure that my students' future professional life will be enhanced by AI um, rather than imperiled by it? Uh, I um, am convinced that at some point success has to be a measure in terms of students' ability to integrate both technical problem-solving skills, uh, the kind that are developed in STEM fields, for instance, as well as creative thinking and critical thinking skills that uh, are specifically developed in humanities curriculum. My academic background uh, informs my thinking about this. Uh, I'm a historian of science and technology who is interested in polymaths, Renaissance men, if you like, who worked at the intersection of many disciplines as well as science and, and faith in general. My intuition about this though really came into focus two years ago um, as I began developing a project uh, um, with this uh, man here. So this is uh, Gerald Penn, uh, a computer science prof at UFT, specializes in computational linguistics. 
Um, and like me, uh, he cultivate many areas of interest. And I met with him over lunch in 2019 to figure out whether or not we could um, create a bridge between our respective departments. Um, Gerald has interest in classics, uh, in theology, as well, of course, as in the sciences. Um, the result of that meeting uh, is a first year seminar that we've now taught twice, and hopefully we get a chance to teach a third time uh, next year, uh, called Intelligence, Artificial, and Human. And we teach it in two locales um, with students who come from the humanities, or aspire, I should say, to becoming humanists, uh, as well as students who uh, would like to become computer scientists. So first year students, brand new to the university, and we have them sit together uh, in a seminar format to discuss a number of things. One of the highlights of my first discussion with Gerald, and, uh, and that really became one of the focus uh, of our course was a thought experiment. And I can't see you right now. Uh, I will just pretend I can see your hands coming up and down, but uh, let's, let's try to run it, if you will. Uh, the experiment goes like this. We ask students in class, who here believes or, or agrees with the following statement? The brain is a computer. We asked them a second question right after this one. Who here agrees with this statement? The brain is a tree. And then after we sort of, you know, assess how the classroom responds, we ask them why. Why is it that the overwhelming majority of students and maybe some of you as well are perfectly comfortable with that first statement? And why is it that the majority of them resist the second? sometimes feel it sounds a bit ludicrous. They suspect there's a catch here in, in the question, but let me elaborate a bit more on this. Uh, first of all, uh, both of these statements are metaphorical. They're not, they're not factual. Uh, yet somehow there needs to be an explanation as to why the first one feels intuitive and natural and the other forced or contrived. And the answer often lies in the pop cultural references that our students have, or the general popular science understanding of the brain for that matter, their relationship with computers. It's interesting though, uh, to dig a bit deeper and realize that over history, there's been a number of metaphors that have been used to talk about intelligence or brain or nerve physiology. Uh, ranging from hydraulics and mechanical clocks uh, imagery to electrochemical factories and all the way to the more contemporary views, uh, which tend to shape the research programs of neurologists, at least some of them, as well as computer scientists, uh, which is the one influenced by the computer. But the tree itself uh, had its adherent uh, in the past. In fact, if you, if you go back to the 18th century, you find natural historians, very eminent figures in their days, who were in fact thinking of the brain and the nerve system as tree-like. Um, the brain here would serve as a kind of soil that the nerves would use to draw nourishment from. Uh, that idea a deeper roots, no pun intended, in uh, Plato's Timaeus, and Aristotle's De Anima, works of antiquity that uh, intuited some resemblances between the development of the tree as well as that of human beings. Jump to the Renaissance and you have anatomists that build on some of these insights as they illustrate, represents the workings of the human body. This is from Vesalius, for instance. Uh, here we can already see that the analogy uh, is actually drawing or, or driving a certain research program, or at least its reception. In the Enlightenment, you have famous figures like Lemaitre writing Man, a Machine, but also a sequel that's lesser known called Man, a Plant. We want to think about the current research programs that we developed in terms of the philosophical, historical, and literary context that nourished those developments. And that's something we do in class. 
I would also add as a, as a side note that recent research, particularly natural history, botany, ecology, has revealed and then, of course, stimulated a lot of speculation about the intelligence or the social life um, of trees and plants. Uh, and although a lot of it is exaggerated or, or romanticized, uh, it still raises the question of what our research into human intelligence would look like if rather than starting from the idea, the notion that there's something computer-like to its workings, we were looking at the vegetable realm. And rest assured, we're not trying to convince your children to venture into that specific line of inquiry, um, but we are interested in contextualizing the work that they are bound to develop, whether they're going into the computer sciences or into other fields. More broadly, let's talk about what the humanities can bring to the computer scientists and for that matter, to the STEM curriculum. Something that came out of my early discussions with Gerald, as well as my discussions with uh, students bound to become computer scientists is that their field is really an engineering field. Um, they are trained to solve problems and become very good at it. And these problems typically involve some kind of optimization process that is maximizing or minimizing um, a certain outcome as defined with certain parameters. Uh, typically, what we find is that the approach to this problem solving uh, requires breaking down a complex task that's been given to them into smaller pieces until gradually they arrive at a satisfying solution. And that solution is not going to be perfect, uh, but it will be as efficient as possible, cost effective, and so on and so forth. I want to underscore how useful this is. We, we want students who are capable of solving problems and who have the technical skills to actually do it. Um, and certainly it's also useful when it comes down to evaluating um, their success. If we have a, a target problem that is given to students and, and we know how to solve it and students succeed at it, we will know right away uh, and we can better assess their development. But that comes also with some limitations. When I have uh, STEM students taking my classes in the humanities, particularly history of science, they, they rank pretty high up uh, in, uh, in the roster, usually because they approach uh, the problems of doing research and writing similarly as you know, the solving an optimization of complex tasks, if you will they rarely end up at the very top uh, of the class though, generally because they are not trained in thinking outside of these pre-established parameters that have been given to them. When you think about the field of the humanities as a whole, it doesn't lend itself so well to that kind of compartmentalization and break breaking down into steps. Um, Students in the humanities from the start, in fact, are expected to come up with the frames that they have to solve. They're not given a problem set to work with. And this habit of asking questions about a world that is hazy in its contours, uh, and certainly hazy in its evaluation, evaluation skill uh, schemes, can be uh, very profitable, we find. And initiating STEM students to that kind of thinking uh, really opens up a whole range of possibilities in what they're doing. Um, when we uh, hear of young startup companies, um, brilliant people who end up in Silicon Valley, it's often the case that they talk about the problems that need to be solved in the world in terms of optimization. Uh, they will, they'll talk about the maximization of happiness or utility or freedom or you know, whatnot. You know. They import with them a way of thinking that they've developed in the curriculum as it, as it exists. And that to me is a bit worrisome because none of these ideas, happiness, good, utility, whatever you want to call them, is something that can be determined, decided using those optimization methods. 
and students will rarely get a chance to discuss what those mean in practical terms as well as in human terms, broadly speaking, outside of the humanities curriculum. It means that the world of advanced technology is myopic in some respects when it comes to setting itself goals that we would call wise, um, or desirable even. The kind of disruption that the world will encounter is also part of that equation as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not just talking about the so-called AI revolution that may or may not unfold as predicted. I'm also talking about the compounds of crises, whether geopolitical, environmental, and also to some extent uh, intellectuals that they will be confronted with, but won't necessarily be fully equipped to address and answer. And engineers we will need undoubtedly but we also want engineers who are visionaries, who are capable of setting themselves objectives of regulating their activities through ethical boards, through legislations. And, and in all fairness, you can't ask that of engineers, not all of them anyway, you need humanists to join the conversation. And, and so we get perhaps to the other side of the story. Uh, it's easy for me to sing the praises of the humanities. I'm, I'm of course, you know, biased in that respect. Um, but there are in fact challenges with that side of the educational system as well. Um, for one, uh, students in the humanities tend not to cultivate uh, a curiosity or a willingness to engage with technical matters. They become very good at asking questions about the world at thinking of problems, but they're not necessarily apt to tackle them or solve them in a way that their STEM counterparts will be receptive to. And as a result of that, they can fall out of a conversation. Um, the historian think of the world as the product of a complex nexus of causes. The philosopher will examine the hidden assumptions behind our reasoning and propose sometimes what ought to be done about it. And literary scholars of all kinds uh, teach us that form and content can be related in a way to generate an impact, an aesthetic or, or moral impact on people. And, and sometimes, you know, will become master rhetoricians in their own right. But, they often share in common um, this notion that uh, mathematics is somehow scary. It's, it's in a separate category of its own. Um, and the technical sciences that you know, are sometimes based on, on mathematical developments um, is somewhat inaccessible to them. What we realize while teaching our course is how much um, myth or false prophecies uh, students will peddle or repeat uncritically because pundits in the computer science, in the industry, even in the university sometime will, um, will prevail over their own reading of the material and engagement with it. And I think you would agree with me that these students who are poised to become uh, leaders in their own ways should be able to engage that material since it will transform the world in which we live for the better or the worse. Really. So the question that emerged after that and the one that I'll honestly, I guess, state is, is something I'm, I'm trying to work out uh, as this happened is how do we address the challenge of integration between humanities and, and STEM cultures? Uh, so we have a classroom experiment on the way. Um, and, and to some extent, it seems to be successful. We have students now who are even interested in continuing the course in the form of a reading group uh, so as to deepen their engagement with some of the material that we cover, whether it's historical, philosophical, literary, or technical. Um, but 
the issue we're all face is not to fall for the buzzword of interdisciplinarity without really understanding what that can mean. Um, there are many good efforts for this uh, across higher education, often enough involving hybrid disciplines, the development of programs that uh, attempt to incorporate, let's say, uh, computer science ideas or skills or programs into traditional fields. And that's good, don't get me wrong, but I don't think that it provides students with the foundational skills that they need in order to really assume positions of leadership um, and thrive in, in, in a future world where creative thinking and critical thinking will be essential not to be replaced by, by machines. Um, the challenges uh, that uh, we face are cultural, they are institutional as well. Um, I think that uh, often enough, rather than privileging the development of well-rounded individuals, we will try to um, implement a kind of superficial integration without necessarily providing an incentive um, as well as really giving them a permission to, to really fulfill this creative impulse and this curiosity they may have. Uh, the four year long undergraduate degree is, I think a bit too short, in fact, to cover all the material that an engineer, computer scientists, biologists need to acquire in order not to be dangerous um, or perhaps less cynically in order to be competitive on the marketplace. And in this limited time frame students will tend to take specialization in a field to concentrate their effort uh, into a particular discipline without venturing very far outside of it, uh, perhaps a few electives here and there, but they won't really have time nor the uh, motivation to cross into the social sciences and the humanities. And the same is true uh, on the other side of the metal, though typically uh, fear of math, uh, fear of the challenge that, that it may represent um, is, um, is the main motivating factor. Uh, that's something, by the way, that uh, really needs to be addressed much earlier than the university. Uh, once a person's identity is tied to the feeling you're not good at math, it's very hard to undo it. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, as, as undergrads anyway, um, the tendency to believe that specializing in something will be beneficial for you on the job market um, is, I think, um, a, somewhat of a misconstrual of what will happen uh, by the time they end their studies. Uh, if they're all swimming in the same pool, all in the same direction, uh, aiming for you know top grades in their field, all but the very, very top contenders will be able to demarcate themselves from the rest. Um, there will also be uh, more competition within the undergraduate degree uh, in such a way that uh, students don't really enjoy what they're doing as much as they should, particularly in the early years of their degree when they're still trying to figure out uh, what they're good at. Uh, it's also a possibility that the kind of cross-pollinization that, that was in fact envisioned by early computer theorists uh, in the 20th century uh, will not be as likely to happen uh, if we compartmentalize these curriculum. I was floored uh, a few years ago to learn that there are at U of T more incoming computer science students than there are in all humanities disciplines combined. And you can imagine that that kind of competition has a lot to do with um, the mental health crisis that the universities are facing these days. Most of you, I presume, are aware that the administrators of the university faculty uh, are now making this a priority. We, we realize that particularly in the context of social isolation, but long before that, in the very structure of the education we give, students feel lonely, uh, isolated, and they feel stressed. Uh, societal pressure, parental pressure at times, uh, and the pressure that they themselves put on, on, um, on themselves will uh, impact the way that they develop. 
And a classroom like the one uh, we have built um, yeah. and that is being promoted as part of a broader initiative of first year seminar um, is, is really meant to address this uh, sense of community, intellectual community of students who can engage with faculty directly and address some deep questions of meaning that they won't get a chance to address in a lecture hall in a technical field is what we think is, is the path forward. Um, there's, a, um, there's a sense to which I think our classroom becomes one of our students' favorites because of all these factors. And one of the things we try to uh, change in their mindset is their understanding of what success might mean. Um, there are myths circulating in the student body about uh, what success consists of. And typically it means finishing a degree in four years in a discipline that currently has prestige um, and often also uh, involves not making any mistakes uh, along the way or failures, failures. And that's unfortunate because those are in fact quite formative learning experience and education, if anything, should be formative, not just a matter of training. Now, where do we go forward uh, with this? It goes without saying that this presentation is, in, is an invitation. And I hope that um, you can begin to see perhaps uh, what we think is, is the appeal behind uh, an integrated curriculum, even if that offering is not yet there. Um, Gerald and I are working, we're doing our, our best, uh, but others will have to follow suit and we're confident are in the process of doing so. Let me return perhaps though to the, the bigger concerns that I started with. Um, personally, I'm not all that worried about the so-called AI revolution, um, not because uh, somehow, you know, on the big scheme of things, let's say these kinds of changes have happened, more so that the predictions that are being made by pundits, uh, in my view, are um, based upon a rather naive understanding of progress and uh, technological development. Uh, there's an incentive also on the part of big tech companies and to some extent university marketing departments to um, to create a hype around recent breakthroughs that really are the continuation of work that has been going on for decades and decades. Uh, and if you look, in fact, at some of the predictions, you start seeing the, the, the clock is, is running out here and we haven't yet seen uh, a thorough change in the way that the job market is, um, is shaking in the moment. It's not to say that in the long run, there won't be major transformation of the service industry but it is to say that students who are in fact proving creative enough uh, uh, really as they, as they become you know, full grown adults and, and part of the job market uh, will likely be um, uh, really favored by those development rather than um, threatened by it. At least that's, that's what we're banking on as we're developing our, our program. Uh, I should also point out that the kind of ideas that there's a scare around AI can go back to a very long time. And sometimes uh, we see that the posits are a different age at, at a, even a very different view uh, of what this might mean. Um, I.J. Good in 1965, a very famous essay begins with the statement that the survival of humanity depends essentially on the development of super intelligence, a kind of singularity. So the opposite of the kind of fear that we have today. Uh, Good was living in a time when nuclear annihilation was very much on their minds, as well as environmental catastrophes coming to the fore um, with the work of Rachel Carson's. It was in the air. And, and somehow the idea of superintelligence was uh, a necessary condition for our survival uh, rather than a path to destruction. How that change is an interesting question I don't have time to address, but it certainly has something to do with Hollywood uh, and, and various other forms of pop culture that nourish our imaginations, particularly younger folks who consume science fiction movies, for instance, uh, but are not themselves very imaginative. 
And I would suggest that a study of the humanities, history, philosophy, literature especially, um, can play an important role here in imagining new futures than those uh, provided to us by you know, the, the big uh, corporations and, and news industry and media industry that, um, that we consume. Um, and once this is done, we can begin thinking differently about the problems coming ahead, thinking differently about the way the university might prepare students for it best. Um, and uh, I hope that you will get a chance to talk with your children um, or wherever else you know is going to university or will go soon uh, and have um, an honest discussion about this. Um, I look forward now to your questions and um, hopefully we can address some of the points I haven't had a chance to cover well here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Richard, for sharing your research with us. Um, now we're going to move into a time for Q&A. Participants, you can use your Q&A function in the bottom uh, control panel to submit your questions. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome back Professor Richard. Thank you, Maxine. Um, so it's nice to see so many of you attending live. Um, uh, before I get started, I'd like to just make an announcement. One of my colleagues, Phelan Parker, will be giving a similar presentation um, next week. Uh, and you can find the information for that on the St. Mike's website. Uh, and he will address questions that deal with technology, but through the lens of video games. Um, and so that should be very interesting. Uh, there are already a few questions in uh, the Q&A, so let me uh, get started. The first one is, is a very interesting one. Um, this is anonymous. Uh, are there women polymaths in history that can be regarded as role models? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, the one that comes to mind, given my area of research, would be Émilie du Châtelet. She was an 18th century uh, figure of you know, uh, great interest, uh, uh, best known perhaps in the pop culture as Voltaire's uh, mistress, but that's a very, very unfair depiction of what she was able to accomplish. Um, uh, she, uh, among other things, uh, translated Newton um, into French, the mathematical work of Newton, after she had self-taught herself advanced mathematics. Uh, she had, she had uh, you know, some collaborators in this, uh, and she did so as, an, as a grown-up, which I think is, is admirable. Uh, she wrote works of pedagogy as well uh, on the metaphysics of Leibniz uh, and Wolf, who were, you know, rather you know, obscure Latin writing uh, German uh, philosophers at the time, uh, she wrote on uh, on topics like love and, and friendship, um, and you know, was a worldly person, very much involved in the social circles that that prevailed at the time. So maybe someone people can look at. Uh, there are a few polymaths through history and especially recent history, uh, I, I have no doubt that there are women that scholars have yet to discover and encounter and render justice to. Um, and, you know, the closer we get to today, you know, the more likely we will see some of these names uh, come up. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the era of specialization, of hyper-specialization that we are living through makes us less likely under current uh, circumstances to, to see these people emerge. But I think that uh, there's one or two already who came through my classroom. Um, and so there's, there's good news there. Um, let's see, uh, a second question asks, uh, oh, that's interesting too. Have you asked the brain as computer or tree question to older folks? What do you think their answer would be? Uh, so I'm tempted to say, it depends what you mean by older. <laughs> uh, I'd say I asked it to my colleague, Professor Penn, whose age I'm not going to divulge. And, and, and I had at least a, a response um, on his part. The 
the less facetious answer would be, uh, no, we have not done that systematically, but it's a great idea. Uh, I think it would, it, it would be something worth, um, you know, actually doing. I suspect it would vary quite a bit uh, we, because, you know, the, the kind of pop cultural understanding of science that people grew up with changed uh, over time. The idea uh, that the brain is a computer is quite old. Uh, you find it um, in the works of um, von Neumann in, uh, I think he published a work on, to this effect in 1958. Um, and, and so shortly thereafter, that idea uh, picked up steam. And I suspect that people who grew up in that generation would very much uh, be comfortable with at least the idea uh, the idea taken, you know, metaphorically as a heuristic. Um, I suspect that people who grew up in a new age sort of countercultural era would also have uh, a say in this and might find the, uh, the, the, the brain as tree idea more appealing. Um, but all this is, is speculation. So, um, and I see some people, uh, you know, are commenting older folk uh, in the sense of 70 years old or plus um, and did not. So I, I think that 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 would make sense, right? If you did not grow up in an era where the computer was omnipresent, that would not be um, intuitive. Um, and so I, I suspect uh, as, or I guess I should say what I'm interested in is to, to see, you know, in retrospect, maybe a few decades from now, what people will think, uh, uh, the brain with, um, so, but it's, it's an open question, of course. Thank you. Uh, Mei Chan writes, uh, what are your thoughts on making the learning of technical skills more accessible? Many people bent toward, um, or already in the humanities still say things like, I'm not good at math, um, and don't see where they belong in areas requiring technical skills. How do we encourage the learning of technical skill in a safe, inclusive way? Great question as well. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in the talk, I think that much of that work needs to be done earlier. It's, it's gonna be difficult I and mean, it's difficult for me, even as someone who is an example of someone who you know took a primarily humanities path uh, to my education to actually uh, go back and rebuild the basic skills that uh, ought to be developed as children. I would recommend the work of um, a mathematician and computer scientist named Seymour Papert. Uh, if I have time, I will uh, type it in, in the chat. Uh, a book called Brainstorms. Um, which deals very much with that question and certainly inspired the way that I, uh, that I think about this. So I, I would direct you to that, that book, which you'll find very thought provoking. As far as sort of, you know, grown up young adults are concerned, I think a, a useful path uh, or at least a middle ground between this is to take courses into the history and philosophy of science, because it is a discipline, it is a middle discipline or a mediating discipline between uh, STEM fields and, and the traditional humanities. Um, and I think that once someone is hooked, to, uh, to that, uh, the kinds of questions that one asks uh, in this, it invites um, furthering one's um, mathematical or, or scientific research. So um, let's see, a few more questions have come in. Uh, has the COVID-19 experience had an effect on your students' view of what their education should uh, prepare them for? Um, the main, the main difference. So the first seminar that we we taught uh, was live, right? and and I think students benefited from from that kind of settings. Uh, the the way we ran it online over Zoom uh, worked quite well uh, this year. I would say you know not quite as well, but but very nearly so. Uh, the main difference though was the fact that we had a very very cosmopolitan. Uh, audience, uh, people, you know, truly, in this case, truly global classroom, because many of the incoming students who would normally have moved to Toronto uh, had to stay home. Um, and so I think there's a, 
at the very least, it made very acute to them the um, the flaws or, or the inherent limitations, I should say, uh, of the very large introductory classrooms uh, that are prerequisites in in STEM fields, and drove them to, you know, examine perhaps you know possibility of taking more small classroom humanities of the sort that, that we taught uh, because the isolation was just much more profound than if people shared a life on campus or at least sat around with other people. Uh, I think it's too early to draw a general conclusion yet, but one of the things that Gerald and I are looking forward to is continuing our conversation with these cohorts. Um, and we, what we did this year uh, is we began a reading group on, in fact, a famous 20th century polymath named Norbert, Norbert Wiener, um, who's one of those pioneering figures in, in the field of artificial intelligence and cybernetics. Uh, and we are inviting students, as well as some faculties and, and graduate students to to join in a bi-weekly conversation. And, uh, and that conversation is centered for this particular year around the, the body of works that this, that this man did, uh, but should be reiterated year after year. Um, and we hope that that creates a sense of community between students, but also motivate them to think about cross-disciplinary thinking um, you know, throughout their undergraduate uh, studies uh, and, and beyond. Um, so hopefully that has answered uh, your question. Uh, let's see, uh, Al Saplis, Saplis, I apologize if, if I mispronounce. Have you encountered some universities or liberal arts college that provides a base curriculum in the first two years that try to achieve some of the goals you have alluded to? Off the top of my head, I can't point you toward one, but but they, there are programs, increasingly programs that are attempting to integrate um, the humanities and science curriculum. Uh, they, I, I think that, you know, the University of Toronto is bound to develop eventually uh, something along those lines. Um, and uh, there are, of course, liberal arts college, famous ones uh, like St. John's, for instance, uh, that incorporate mathematics as part of their curriculum, um, precisely because there's a sense that doing an undergraduate degree, um, uh, investing time reading, you know, great books uh, and, 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 and facing the thoughts of people from the past can, can be beneficial for someone who desires to specialize in a discipline afterwards, right? And um, that, that's my sense also, and it is Gerald's sense too. Uh, uh, Gerald had uh, an undergraduate degree, at least started one at the very least in classics uh, and, and mathematics. And, and at the time when he was doing computer science, uh, you, one didn't go into a computer science degree as an undergrad, one went as a graduate student once you had acquired a solid basis in other fields. And I think that still uh, is a good advice today, especially for students who you know envision uh, pursuing beyond the undergraduate degree to do uh, masters or PhD, uh, whether it's you know going into academia or or you know more you know research with with fundamental uh, enterprise or, or whatnot. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, Melissa Atley writes, uh, hello, Professor Richard, uh, as a mom uh, of a high schooler who's very interested in pursuing a career in STEM field, what do you suggest in terms of providing him with a proper humanities education to supplement his focus on STEM? Right. So that's, that's a big challenge um, because, again, depending on what field you go in in STEM, that will occupy the better part of, um, of his undergraduate career. Uh, the most important thing, I think, outside of the curriculum is uh, developing an interest in reading. Uh, the single most important thing that a student at the undergraduate level can learn um, is, is how to read uh, critically and write well. 
And unfortunately, there is almost no time invested uh, to that effect in, in the STEM field. It's at full capacity already. Uh, there are ways of doing some humanities work through elective courses. Um, if, uh, if finances are not an issue, and they obviously most of the time are, I think that taking more time to complete a degree is perfectly uh a perfectly good option. I, I usually recommend my students, if if they can, do your four-year degree in five, uh, not to slack off necessarily, though sometimes taking things a bit easier in the first year is a great idea, but also with a view of rounding up whatever the main specialization they're doing with uh, an adjacent and not so adjacent uh, minor, perhaps. Right? Um, that being said, if, 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 you're, if your son is you know, loves uh, mathematics, if, if your son loves uh, whatever the main science, there's no point in, you know, forcing them in, in a different path. I think that, you know, the, 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 for them to thrive, they need to be happy in what they do. But strategically, uh, reading a lot outside of their field so as to improve their style and their ability to understand text is, is critical. Um, I can't overemphasize it. And critical for researchers, of course, who are in STEMs, who, you know, go on to graduate and, and, and try to make their, their mark in the world. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. I should say also my email, I think, was share, will be shared at the end. So for whoever I don't have time to full answer, feel free to reach out to me directly and, and I'll be happy to, uh, to, to chat with you. Um, Kathleen Martin writes, uh, what do you understand to be the contributions and challenges theology can make to the discussion of AI? It's a great question too. Uh, I know that St. Mike's, uh, or should the University of St. Michael's College uh, Faculty of Theology uh, is you know, thinking about uh, you know, venturing into the, this field and I don't want to overstep, I don't know where they're at in that, uh, in that process, but it's a, it's a field that does not really exist because it's uh, like uh, the kinds of discussions that AI raise theologically vary tremendously. Um, uh, the, uh, and of course, when people think of AI, they tend to think of sort of autonomous agent that could be treated perhaps as persons. And in that sense, of course, uh, theology should have something to say about this. And um so what places uh, can you go to for this? Um, there's a very long established tradition of uh, going back to the Middle Ages of theologian pondering how to interact with an other that would be alien to this world, right? So there are in fact thinkers in the Middle Ages who are you know, thinking there, there could be inhabitants on Jupiter and Mars and Venus and the planets that, that were visible at the time. And, and how would we interact with these people, knowing that they may or they may not share the same um, uh, soteriological needs, needs for salvation, for instance, um, and the same kind of thinking still exists in you know people interested in theology and science, and I think to some extent it's analogous to the questions we would ask to um, creatures of our own, made in our own image, perhaps or or not. Um, so I. I, I don't know the, the answer to that because I think it's still a field that is trying to assert itself. Uh, there is no such artificial agent that has reached that level yet. We may never get there. Who knows? Uh, there's a lot of contingencies. Um, if we do, that's when theology will have not only to speculate, but to adjust to that reality. Uh, as it always does as a field it is you know as as you probably know since you're asking the question uh this is a disputative field that is very dynamic it changes over over centuries um we have another question here uh, thank you for the wonderful well you're very welcome um uh, i've had a stem education and your thought resonates so much in my experience and thoughts i find that i did not get an education on how to really think rather on how to be a good robot and solve whatever problems given to me. I personally feel more aligned with the humanities. I'm seriously considering going back to school for humanities education, perhaps in literature or philosophy. What do you suggest someone who has had uh, only a STEM education but find themselves passionate about the humanities? Uh, 
I, I think that um, there, there are many paths. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in, very much in favor of the history and philosophy of science because it's a, um, it's a field that's contingent to, or contiguous, I should say, to uh, interest in the sciences. Um, so good place to start. Um, I, I, I want to use, you know, the few minutes I have to plug the program in which I, I teach as my primary uh, function, which is the Christianity and Culture program at UFT, which is a liberal arts type uh, program, multidisciplinary, which gives a lot of flexibility to students to, you know, pick and choose uh, courses that they would find um, of interest. Um, and, uh, I, and I would say, go for it. The number of colleagues of mine who went through STEM fields before landing into my discipline is, you know, significant. Um, the, and certainly the history of my discipline starts, in fact, with scientists uh, who, who are intrigued, interested in the history of their work. Um, uh, and sometimes they did a good job, sometimes they didn't. And so that's why eventually the humanists had to, to weigh in on this. Uh, I think philosophy is a good idea, um, but um, do, do what, what appeals to you. If you can, if you can afford it, it's, it, it won't be lost. You'll have a great strength, I think, in being able to combine those two sets of skills, um, which are often lacking, um, uh, Betty writes, uh, yes, please define older. So that was a reference. So, uh, and, and we had uh, an answer. It's a, it's a, it's a touchy question here. Um, students think I'm old. Uh, for what it's worth. Uh, Douglas Orm, uh, it is fair to suggest that the preeminent technology of any era uh, becomes the go-to metaphor for understanding the brain and or brain and soul. Is it fair to suggest? So there may be historical and generational and gender preferences for the metaphor people gravitate to. So I, yes, uh, I think that that's a very fair uh, caveat. Uh, I wouldn't want to essentialize the, you know, debate and, 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 um, and basically get, get rid of all the, the subtle differences that might exist or the different lenses. Uh, there is no such thing as, you know, science right, in a sort of universal sense, it, or at least as a practice, it varies from place to place, generation, generation, gender, races. Um, and so uh, that said, I think that there are trends that can be measured. And when it comes to the teaching uh, and, and, and the research that's being done right now and has been done for a few decades, the trend has very much been, you know, defined by the computer um, metaphor, which is not uh, an arbitrary trend. I don't mean to, to dismiss it there. There's a way in which you can define computing and, and even computer uh, that is so general that it, it can in fact encompass what the brain does um, uh, and possibly even mentation, uh, but uh, we don't want to forget this this history of of changes, lest it blinds us to many of the factors that determine the research projects that that we that we develop and the sources of funding that people are willing to uh, to invest in. Um, so. I, I take your 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 input. I think that it's a, it's perfectly fair. Uh, Maruta uh, Vodkus Lukina, I apologize again for pronunciation. Uh, I could volunteer uh, some older person. Uh, my answer to the question is whether um, brain is computer or tree. Um, uh, I would definitely both. Okay, so that's that's interesting, right? So one of the interesting thing with with metaphors is that. Uh, a metaphor will have two roles. It will uh, limit perhaps the range of associations that one will make between two objects that are being compared. Uh, and in that sense, it can serve as a point of focus or as uh, blinkers, right? Uh, it also enables um, uh, 
associations, right? And that that two um, that two way process, I think, is is a case no matter what uh, metaphor one uses. If you're looking for an interesting uh, read on this question, I would recommend exactly Do- Douglas suggests Lakoff and Johnson, really, really thought provoking book uh, that that deals with even more fundamental metaphors um, uh, than you know, than, than the sort of almost literary ones that, that we use to describe uh, or structure research projects. Uh, so strong recommendation for, for that book as well. Uh, we're running out of time now. Um, so, and there's many, many more questions. Uh, so what I will suggest, I, if the organizers are, are letting me stay, I can, I can stay, but I believe we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, I will take note of those questions, uh, and um, and and certainly, if you want to reach out and ask them uh, to me, I would very much value uh, your input. Uh, the the course, as I say, is an invitation. It's a the starting point for hopefully a discussion that will be ongoing, uh, and and you know, is very valuable to uh, to hear what you have to say, um, and. Um, let me let me briefly thank uh, while well, they're still uh, present. So Maxine uh, Webster uh, organizes this uh, series with the Alumni Association. So thank you again for giving it a chance. Uh, Heather Bannister, uh, Joseph Larella, John Santiago were part of the the team at the campus event that uh, set this up and make sure that things uh, were running very smoothly. Um, and um, once again, if, uh, if you have questions, reach out to me and, and don't forget there, there are more coming. Phelan Parker next week. I think you should uh, uh, take a look at, at what he has to say. Um, so um, on this note, Maxine, did you wanna have the final word or shall we close this? I think we can uh, probably close it in the chat. I'll put, I've already put your email and it'll be on the closing slide as well. And I'll also uh, put the link to register for Dr. Parker's um, lecture next week. But thank you all for joining. Thank you.